I'm Scott L. Miller. It's the 1st of December 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Two days ago, we said what not to do, what absolute thing to avoid if you're moving to Nicaragua and looking at maybe buying a house or something of the sort. I got asked, well, okay, Scott, you tell us what not to do. That's fine. Don't do that thing. But what do you do instead? You can't do nothing, obviously. And I agree, you can't just do nothing. So what is the thing you're supposed to do if the obvious thing that everyone wants to do is something you shouldn't do? Well, we're gonna be answering that on today's video, and we're gonna get to that with the dogs here right after the bump. All right, when it comes to what you should do when you're looking at potentially moving and owning a home here in Nicaragua, and that is the context for those who didn't watch the video from two days ago. First of all, pause this, go watch that, give it a thumbs up, do all the things, finish it, and then come back to this so that, and make sure you leave a comment on that one saying what a good bit of advice it was, then come back here, do all the same things here, and we will continue. Okay, you're back, good. So what we were talking about is you're looking at moving to Nicaragua. Maybe you're here on a vacation and you decide you just love it and you wanna find a place permanently or you're abroad and you're looking at pictures or you visited but you're now not here and you want to start shopping around, find a house, a, maybe just a little cottage on the, on the ocean or maybe it's a mansion, maybe it's your retirement home, maybe it's a vacation place. Whatever, you want to start looking, and we talked about how you absolutely don't do this. Don't get online, don't look from abroad. It's going to uh, do a lot of things to create a lot of problems. Watch that video, it explains all the psychological things that will happen to you and why it's super dangerous. But now we need to tackle a positive, what do you actually do? And unfortunately, this is going to be kind of negative because the answer is not going to be a great one. It is the thing you need to know, but it is not a fun answer. And it's unfortunate that there are times that here in Nicaragua, we have to give you bad news. Not everything is perfect in paradise. There's a lot of great things. We love how mild the weather is. I love what a great day it is. I have beautiful blue skies. I have lovely breeze. It's only barely warm. I don't need air conditioning today. The house is wide open. I'm not covered in mosquitoes. The dogs are playing outside. It, it's just a beautiful day, right? This is great. Life is good. Housing is cheap. Food is cheap. Things are healthy. Life is good. But there are negatives, and one of them is how difficult it is to buy a house, I'm gonna move over because the dog has switched sides, without getting taken advantage of, whether it's getting gringo priced or whether it's uh, getting scammed on the house, not actually getting the deed, not having the property be where you think it is, any number of things can go wrong. So how do we protect you from that? And I've talked about a number of times that the process for this, for people who live here, is literally to walk around and knock on doors. And that sounds absolutely ridiculous. And to quite a degree, you're correct. It is ridiculous that that's what we have to do. There should be solutions for this, but as of right now, there are not. And there are people who have tried to tackle this and have failed to do so. So it's not that no one's thinking about it. It's not that nobody wants it. That's actually a very hard problem for a lot of reasons. The government doesn't have this. Real estate agents don't have this. The, the public does not have this. So we have this challenge. If you're wondering what she has, it's a coconut. Okay, so we know we can't just go online and do things. We have to walk around. It's the only way you're going to know things. You can't go onto a website, even if you had a wonderful website with lots of information. It's gonna be very difficult to look at a website and have any realistic idea of exactly where a house is located, how much it should cost, what the property is really going to be valued at, how much interest there might be in it, what the condition actually is, are the pictures current, and so on and so forth. You're gonna be left with a lot of uh, questions, a lot of gaps in your knowledge of the house. So it's not like you can look at a house online and realistically purchase. You may be able to complete the process, but you're gonna be left with a lot of unknowns. It's very difficult to do so. And there's just natural reasons for this. We talk a lot about bad things things that people may do to take advantage of you, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're simply talking about this is a market here in Nicaragua where there's so much disparity between different houses that you don't have that standard comp system, which in the United States is often used for pricing, but it is used under the hood by people to understand what they're looking at with homes. I lived for a long time, for example, in Carrollton, Texas. In doing so, I was able to look at houses online in places like Plano, Frisco, uh, McKinney 
And by simply looking at a picture of the house, I had a really good idea of what its community around it would look like, what its amenities would look like, what its travel time to other locations would be like, what its roads were like, what its safety and all kinds of factors, simply by looking at maybe a, a quick map view and a picture of the house or a few pictures of the house. I had a lot of information because of comps that exist throughout the area. It didn't take much to know that it looked just like a house down the street, a few blocks away, even a few miles away. Things really didn't vary that much from area to area. And when they did, we normally knew the areas uh, pretty well so that you could make the adjustments in your mind. Here in Nicaragua, that's very difficult to do. If you're looking at my house here or one that's directly across the street over there, they could be wildly different, both in value and in what everyday life is like. If you go just the tiniest bit down the street this way, things change in one way. If you go this way, a different way. And things are very, very disparate over really small areas in every possible aspect, whether it's uh, available amenities, uh, bus service, cost, uh, availability, noise, you name it, things vary a lot over a very small area. So that alone can be very difficult. If you're looking at the kinds of properties that expats are often looking at, you may be also looking at a great degree of disparity in things like road condition. For example, if you're looking at the beaches here in Ponaloya, you've got wonderful roads, well paved, great condition, easy to get in and out. But if you look just one beach away, that looks like it's a basically the same thing, just a few minutes further south at Salinas Grandes, you might suddenly realize that the same looking road from a map view is actually impassable to normal cars. And what would be just a 15 minute travel time here could be an hour down there. What requires a simple car or taxi ride here could require a four by four vehicle that's going to be in very rough shape very quickly down there. And so little tiny differences can make huge changes in what a house is like for you. That same effect is exacerbated if you start looking at other tourist destinations, such as San Juan del Sur or Ometepe. Those places are extremely popular with expats, especially those who are researching. People will do a lot more research there than they will in other areas. The buying rate may be uh, more equal throughout the country, but those areas definitely get the most people who are window shopping. Just, it's beautiful locations that people know a bit more. They're a lot more interesting and unique, so people tend to look there quite a bit. They're also the ones that target expats quite a bit more. So it just naturally happens. Those areas, for unrelated reasons, are extremely disparate, even compared to the rest of Nicaragua. I had people that I knew who lived in uh, San Juan del Sur, as an example, and Ometepe's even more than San Juan del Sur, that they discovered that every little bit of town was dramatically different than any other bit of town. Living downtown or the South Hill or the East Hill or the North Hill were all very different things. And so they actually rented in each of those locations for six months so that they could get an experience from each location to compare them and know what traffic is like, what the roads were like, uh, what public utilities might be like in those different areas, which restaurants were accessible, what their nightlife was like, how loud it was, things like that, what their view of the ocean or what the wind was like. Those little things made a really big difference. So they put in a two year process of just moving through a very small village of just about 15,000 people all within homes that basically could see each other for real. Not, I'm not just saying that in like a perfect condition. I'm saying I think their houses actually could all see each other at some point. Like if you stood on the roofs, they were that close. Um, and yet just that little bit of moving around gave them four completely unique experiences just in that one town. So being able to really get in firsthand and experience an individual location is really important. Now, if you're looking at San Juan del Sur online, you may find houses that are listed as San Juan del Sur that are spread out over an area of more than an hour across, which is a little bit crazy considering that San Juan del Sur is a tiny village that does not have its own departmento of 15,000 people. Everybody wants to slap San Juan del Sur onto their listings. And so anyone who thinks they can get away with it will list it as the village that a house is located in. It could be located on the Costa Rican border, which is quite a way south on very impassable roads from San Juan del Sur or very far north to the point where it's almost out of the departmento of Rivas. Really, those are the Rivas beaches, not the San Juan del Sur beaches, but San Juan del Sur just jacks up the price by having the name associated with the location so people want to put it on there. That means that if you're looking online, you may be looking at a place that's even as much as, probably not quite, but almost an hour away from the place that you're thinking you're looking because they're listing it as there, but actually the house is somewhere else. That's pretty common. And that 
gap of space isn't just, oh, it's a completely different region, completely different restaurants, completely different travel, all that than what you're expecting. It's probably also a completely different part of the country. It has different mountains, has different weather, it has different everything, right? So those things are very important, and that all makes it that the only way to really have a good feel for anything you're going to look at is to physically be here, both going around in person, discovering where you want to be and what you're interested in and knowing what different places are like, but also then taking anything that you do find and making sure that it is where you think it is and doing the things you think it's doing in that space, right? Is it really facing the ocean that you want? Is it really walking distance from the central plaza? Is it really in the tourist zone? Is it really in a safe neighborhood? Neighborhood because quite often you'll find city houses that may be in really rough barrios, but it's a nice looking house. They're able to get just that one photograph of it that seems pretty nice. And then when you go to check it out, you realize it's in an area you may not be comfortable living in. Not that it's unsafe, Nicaragua is very safe, but it could be an area that is not what you want to be living in. In many cases, I've seen that here in Leon. We've gone to look at houses with expats and found them to be in some pretty rough barrios. And it's like, this is not what I was hoping to get for this price. And then it turned out the interior was not so great either. So it worked out, it wasn't a place they were interested in, but those kinds of disparities are very common and, and without being here, it's all but impossible to figure that out. Now the question was asked, so how did I do it? Because I've been here for a while, I have property, I continue to look for property. It's something I take very seriously. So obviously I have a process. What am I doing that's different from other people? How am I making it uh, able to work because I've had pretty good success in my own personal opinion um, and in some other people's opinions, and that's been uh, a challenge. Like, how, how clearly I can't be doing the things that I'm saying, but the reality is, is I actually am. So let's start with a few properties and talk about how we've done this over the years. Remember, I've been here first eight years ago and then moved down permanently almost three years ago. So this has been going on for a while. I was here in 2015, got a really good idea for the country. Uh, our company has been here for quite a long time, not that long, but for quite a long time. So we've had resources here, which is very important. Uh, I was then down here in 2019 for a little while, did a little bit of looking at houses, not for myself, but was doing some more real estate research and then was here in really early 2021, slightly later in 2021, and then back permanently in, in by, by spring of 2021. So with all this, right? How did we find properties? So first of all, the first properties that we found, it's been a lot of time looking at, we did the process that I tell you not to do. So when I tell you it's a terrible idea and that everyone falls for this trick, I fell for it too, as did my wife, as did my business partner, everybody fell for this because it seemed so obvious. And back then there was a lot less information out there to say, this is a bad process and here's why, right? It just, there, when you went and looked, there was nobody telling you what things were really like and what you should do. So that's one of the reasons that I was very adamant about this channel is that there's a lot of information that people really do need, including myself three years ago. I wish I could teleport back and give myself this information then and save myself a lot of time, effort, and heartache. But so when we looked then, we found a lot of time um, that we found houses that looked interesting, but we were lucky. Remember, we had an office here, multiple offices here. So when people would tell us, oh, we got this beautiful house, it's worth this much money, blah, 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 we would send people, once we were really interested and knew that a place was more than just casually interesting, we would send an inspection crew in and they would walk in and routinely would discover that nothing was like what we were told. The location wasn't accurate. The pictures that we saw were years old and the place was actually falling down. Things that were move-in ready were actually missing a roof. Pools that looked pristine in the pictures were empty or really gross. Uh, all kinds of things. People would come in, our crew would come in and be like, you need $100,000 of maintenance just to make the place livable. And what they're trying to sell you as a luxury house that's ready to go. Do not, you know, think this is the value, right? The, this, If you want this place, we could fix it up. But we're talking about rebuilding the structure. There were some places we looked at, looked at that they said we would have to take a bulldozer, knock it down and start over. They were that bad. And sometimes that's worth it. Those are things you need to know. But the information we were getting was totally different. Locations, price and often when we actually would find a place that we were interested in going forward with we would make an offer and suddenly find out that the seller couldn't be contacted directly and their responses weren't rational for someone actually trying to sell a house if they were asking x amount of money and we offered them that amount of money they would suddenly come back and say they needed 50 percent more and then after a while you would finally find out that they weren't interested in selling the house of course there was no real person behind it we're sure it was a bait and switch they wanted to get us on the hook they wanted to make sure we were interested 
interested because they didn't have houses that were available. So they wanted to make sure we were looking at things so that later they could give us something else and maybe we would take that one or we would get frustrated and lower our standards or feel that more money had to be thrown at things and keep raising the stakes. And of course, if we raise the stakes far enough, maybe they would actually track down the people who actually owned a house and be able to make a better offer on it. Who knows? There's a million different scams you can run when you don't get to talk directly to the seller and when there's no legal process that guarantees that what the seller is telling you is what you're being told. That's how it works in the United States, at least legally. If they make, uh, uh, accept an offer, you make an offer, that information does go between the buyer and the seller. If it doesn't, you have legal recourse against the agents and anyone who's involved. So you are to what legal degree you can, guaranteed that the information you're getting is accurate. Here in Nicaragua, there's no such guarantee. If the seller says, oh yeah, we would definitely accept $200,000 and you're offering $300,000, there's every possibility that your agent is gonna absolutely refuse it and say, no, they want $400,000. And when they get $400,000, they'll go to the seller and say, they, they offered you the $200,000 and they come back to the buyers and they say, they, they accepted your $400,000 and they've got $200,000 as a difference. And one side has to pay them a commission on $200,000. The other side has to pay them a commission on $400,000. And so not only are they getting a commission, they may be getting 100% markup on the house to pocket as well. We don't know when that's happening, when it's not happening, but it's certainly something that can happen because there's no protections against it. You don't necessarily have any way to verify that the price you're paying to the seller is the price that they think they're getting. So we went through a number of those processes and eventually gave up. We eventually found a property that we really did like. We did a bunch of research on it. We went and before we actually finalized things, we came here to the country and we inspected it in person. When we inspected it in person, we'd already sent out a crew. We discovered a few things that our crew had missed or had not relayed to us or not realized that we were not aware of. Some of that includes just how far outside of town the property was and the quality of the road that was on. These are all things we had some inkling to, but we didn't have a really good idea. And it's very difficult to convey these ideas when you haven't been to the town. So this was a town we didn't know at all. We thought it would be pretty good. And it would not have been the worst choice, but it was not as ideal as we'd have hoped. When we did look at it, we got really lucky that the deal we had uh, in writing the party selling it tried to swindle us, and in doing so, they accidentally released us from the contract, not, not because they were trying to swindle us. In the act of trying to swindle us, they actually said the words that they would walk away from the contract. We accepted them walking away from the contract, and we were done. We were able to escape. We got really, really lucky. We got protected because of the hubris and greed of someone trying to sell that property. And who knows how many people in between were also in on the deal, maybe none, maybe lots. We just don't know. But what we do know is we got really lucky and got Got protected and having tried to buy from uh, afar was really dangerous. We then put in a lot of work scouring the coast trying to figure out exactly where we did want to be and we did narrow it down significantly to a relatively small area of where we live now. Then we were able to send out our crew who lives here full time and they put in months of going around looking at different properties. They decided that they were going to approach someone that had a property that they wanted even though it was not for sale. They made an offer and they managed to make a deal. They came in with GoPros, we came in with an inspection crew. We put in a lot of effort to have a really good idea about the status of the property, whether it was gonna fall down, what it had been through traditionally. We had lawyers involved that were connected to people we trusted. We were able to do a lot of process in a place that we knew. We knew within a few hundred meters on a flat road of where this place was. We had managed to get drone footage of it. We had live GoPro feeds from it, people standing in there with, you know, getting everything. We had someone able to check that fiber techo service was available there. Uh, it already had it or the building next door did all kinds of things. We had so much information right down to what was the price per month of the internet access we were going to have that we were able to make an extremely informed decision. But it's important to understand that while we did it remotely, it took us years, literally about a year and a half of continuous work, doing research, including quite a bit of time of actually being here in country and literally going door to door. We, at one point, my business partner and I actually drove down a street on a beach, going to every house that looked interesting in any way, knocking on the door and seeing if they're interested in selling and what kind of price they were going to tell us they were looking for. That was really time consuming and a bit stressful, but super informative as well. And we learned a ton really quickly and figured out that basically everything was available, which other people were telling us as well. And we learned how we could go about getting it and what kind of prices we might be able to get. Because when you do that, some people are going to be like, I want oh, this gringos, we're going to get all this money. Other people are like, I want to be the one that they pick. So I'm going to give them a realistic price. And they are the ones that are more likely to get picked if you're going to do that. So it, it makes sense. 
So that was a lot of work and we took on a lot of risk to do that. We have a business, we had a lot of reasons why it made sense for us to take on more risk than normal and I still wouldn't recommend it. I'm very careful about not letting my example of we were reckless for a very clear reason um, that had nothing to do with wanting to move to Nicaragua and, and that pushed us to take some risks that you should not take. But we did a lot of research, years of online research, years of coming to uh, coming in and out of Nicaragua. We knew the areas, we had the people, and when I say we weren't here, we had a team of very trusted people who had been long-term employees, very trusted people here that were local and had a lot of local knowledge and were able to protect us on pricing, were able to handle the negotiations for us, were able to make sure that they never knew there were gringos involved, that they were able to bring in a Nicaraguan inspection crew, they were able to give us real prices for Nicaraguans to do things, and so on and so forth. And with all of that, we probably didn't get the best deal, but we did get a reasonably fair deal, didn't get screwed, and we have a property that we love because of all that. That's how much work we, we did to be able to do it from remote. And when I say we go door to door, I truly mean go door to door. With other properties that we've managed to acquire here, it's always been a situation where it was years of research and a lot of door to door. In one case, I had a property that I found uh, remotely, but I was sure that we wanted. It was not a uh, structure, it's just land, but it was land that I really wanted, and everyone told me it was not available. I, I did a lot of research on it. I followed up with a lot of people. I talked to a lot of people, and it was always, no, there's no way to get it. But we put in a lot of time. We built our connections in a community. We became well-known within reason. Uh, we were respected, and we had a good reputation. With all of that, someone that we knew who was local, had connections, they went and talked to people and put the deal together without our knowledge actually, came to us and said, you need to come talk to these people. I've got something that you wanna see. We went and it turned out to be exactly the property that I'd been saying I wanted for years, but had no idea how we would ever get it. And of course we overpaid for that too, but we knew how much we were overpaying by, we knew what it took to get it. And we knew that uh, if we didn't get it, it was a highly desired spot that uh, once they, they were starting to talk about selling it, they probably would sell it to someone. So we ended up getting that property. But again, years of research, and it was because we were on the ground full time that it made it possible for us. Another place that we have, similarly, years of looking at the property, know the property extremely well, know what other people have offered, have not gotten it for, uh, what deals have fallen through over the years, what uh, asking prices have been, how those have changed over the years, knew everyone involved, both on the seller and the buyer side, knew all kinds of things, have recommended it to other people, just on and on and on. And with that, with years of, of interaction with a property, ended up that when a good deal came up, we were in a position to make a good decision on it. But again, it was essentially going door to door. I put in a lot of time knowing a lot of places because it was relatively local and I, you know, I knew it inside and out. I didn't need to take a tour of it. When we went to look at it, I already knew the property very, very well. I knew every single room. I knew where things had fallen apart. I knew where things had changed. I knew what its history was when it was built, everything. So that kind of stuff is actually how we routinely do our deals. Now, where we rent here, this is not a place that we research on our own. It's not a place that we could research on our own. It's not a place you could find going door to door. And to be able to have this was, again, years of being here, got to be known in the community. And when someone knew that we were looking, somebody went, talked to some people and said, ah, this may be a good situation, that we have renters who are looking for a place, we have rentees, I'm not sure how that works, uh, who, who have a house that they really want someone trusted that will be in there, and they made the introduction and uh, connections, and so we ended up getting a place that was not listed anywhere. And that's really important as well. Every place that we've found that's really turned out well is because we put in a lot of time being a member of the community and built the connections so that we were trusted, so that people made uh, introductions for us, that we were patient and did not try to buy something right away. Anytime we tried to short circuit that process, anytime we tried to look from abroad, anytime we tried to do it faster than we should have, we always ended up getting burned and luckily protected without any of those deals completing, but we always took on a huge amount of risk and potentially would have really screwed ourselves over because we weren't being patient. Patience is the name of the game here. Nicaragua is a place that rewards patients a lot. It is part of the culture. You don't move fast on things and that's really annoying and difficult for North Americans to handle. It is not how we do things. We're used to right now real fast make it happen 
And yes, that's great for a lot of reasons. And I feel you, trust me, I'm like that inside. I want things to be decided. I want action to start being taken. I want, once I know I'm gonna move, I wanna move. Once I'm gonna buy, I wanna buy. But that is not how it's going to work in Nicaragua. And no matter how much you're like me, you have to also be like me and learn to get past that, or you are going to be the person who ends up getting burned. Now, one of the things that was said to me is, okay, but Scott, if you're not going to be living there full time, how do you go about doing this when you're only there once in a while? You're only visiting, you know, a few months out of the year or whatever. My first question is, if you're only visiting a few months out of the year, why do you feel the need to buy a place? Really, I think you should step back and evaluate if buying a place makes sense at all. And I get why we all feel like buying feels great and it's something we want to do and you have something you own. But if you're not here, then you have to deal with keeping it safe, secure, maintained, all that while you're not here. That's all very expensive. If it comes down to a financial decision, almost never is owning a place that you're not at full time actually makes sense. Now, I say that and of course, I am very interested in acquiring an apartment in Guatemala because I want to be able to use it from time to time and I want to Airbnb it the rest of the time. So I am exactly the example of you guys who want to do this and not be there full time. So, okay, I get it. It makes sense. There can be a situation where you want to do that. In Guatemala, however, I'm looking at high-rise apartments that are in uh, downtown areas where there is a ton of comps. They have a building full of identical properties that I can gauge a lot of information on. And I think in theory, I can do so pretty safely. If I get a bad deal, it's probably about the same bad deal that everyone else in the building has gotten. So I'm not out on my own doing a non-comped property. It's a different market. If I was doing the same thing in Nicaragua, I would be very wary if I wasn't living here full time. In one case, I would say yes, Guatemala City, Antigua, you can invest in that way and it probably will make sense for you if the ways that you want to use it when you're not there are things that are sensible, right? You just want to Airbnb it, you just want to have a friend live there, whatever, then those things, as long as you understand what you're trying to do, it's probably sensible. Doing that same thing here in Nicaragua, very, very different. You, you need a completely different set of factors to be able to safely buy and to reasonably maintain a place. That could be very complex if you don't have the connections. If you're not living here for at least a huge amount of the time, making uh, personal connections and creating those relationships, you're gonna struggle to find all the different pieces that you need for the puzzle, whether it's the lawyer that you need or the accountants that you need or the bookkeepers or the cuidadores, the people who actually live in and take care of the property, housekeepers and so forth, you could be left with a property where you're gone for really long periods of time and have very little to no visit visibility into that property while you're trusting a suite of people to do a bunch of tasks and when you get back you find out whether or not that's actually happened or not. And it's not that you have a high chance that they won't have done their jobs, it's more that maybe some things will have cost more than they should have or not been done quite to the standard that you were hoping for and in some cases some really bad things could happen. They could take off with the deed to your house, they could be selling it to people and not telling you that it's full and pocketing all of the money. You could be losing the majority of your income and have no idea, you could be paying for a pairs for people that you didn't even know were staying there and so on. So you bring on a lot of risk anywhere, but especially in a place where you have a, a relationship-based market, much like Nicaragua. If you live here full-time or for a long time and really build those relationships, those things get pretty easy. But if you're just coming in for the short term and in hoping to bounce in and out and to be able to treat it much like you would a Guatemala or United States, then you're probably going to be looking at some really big challenges to make that work out. And all that may sound very negative, but it shouldn't. It's just that the answer is probably something a little bit different than you were expecting and the answer is probably you need to establish rental relationships where you have one or more houses or apartments that you like that you'd like to return to that you set up relationships with where they're excited to have you back you figure out a good price for the time that you're going to be there maybe you get some priority if someone's going to book it they contact you first and say hey you know this place is going to be gone do you want to book ahead and you know then you can return to the place you want. oh you know what i do want to come back i'll take it for another four months whatever those relationships may make a lot of sense and owning may be just crazy. I know that there is a huge emotional drive and Americans are pushed because the government wants you to invest in property because it spurs the economy. Be aware, there is a lot of propaganda at all levels in the United States, including at the banks, to push you to buy property. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Buying property in your home country can do a lot to prop up the economy and make everybody do better. So you're, in a way, just doing your part, and we all benefit from it. So don't think of that as a, ooh, the government's out to get me. They're just looking at the macroeconomic scale instead of the microeconomic scale, but you can often 
and play that game on a micro scale and take advantage of the system and get even more advantages. But here in Nicaragua, you are not part of that macro economy. You are just a person who's trying to figure out how to best find a place to live for you. And buying a house is almost certainly going to be a very bad idea if you are not already here and in a position to have already started establishing your connections and making those relationships and going door to door and really knowing the properties that you're looking at so that you're not going in blind. Now, I know what you're going to say, but I'm only coming in from time to time now. I want to be able to retire someday, but I'm working right now. So I come and I go and I'd like to start putting money into the house and own it over time. And when I go to retire, I will go to this house that I've been living in part time for a long time. I will have made it the, the way that I want it and it'll be all ready for me. And it'll be, I can start now on my retirement. I, I know why that feels good and I know why it makes sense. And there's a lot of cases where that's a really good way of thinking about it. But if you're not here in Nicaragua to do the things you need to do, it's probably going to set you up for failure. That house that you could have gotten for 100000 you may pay 200000 for. The house with the gorgeous view, you may end up without the view that you think you're going to get. There's so many things to go wrong and so much potential advantage to just being patient that you may be throwing away all the advantages you think you're getting. When you say, well, I'm going to start putting in little by little, sure, but you may have to put in twice as much. You don't need to do little by little if you're not gonna pay as much as you are. If you need to do little by little for a $200,000 house, imagine not having to do that at all for a $100,000 house. If you would have been putting away X amount of dollars every year for say 10 years leading up to retirement into the house and now you feel, well, I'll have to buy it all at once. No, take that money you would have put into it, put it into a savings account or better, an investment fund like an index fund and let that money accrue interest and build up a nest egg so that when you do come down, you're in a better position to buy more with cash. And it's not just that you can buy more with cash. This is a cash economy. The chances that you can take out any kind of mortgage is going to approach zero. It's not completely impossible, but it might as well be. And even if you can take it out, the rates are really high and you don't want to. So that means you need to have cash. That means the longer you hold off and keep putting money away, especially if that money is accruing interest, then you are gonna have more buying power to get a bigger house over time. And the longer you're here and the better relationships you have, the less you will pay for that house and the more ideal of a house you will be able to select. All that said, Yes, right now we are at the all-time low of the market and we do expect it to come up, but we don't expect it to come up quickly. So chances are it's going to remain depressed for a very long time. It's already been depressed for six years. It's very likely gonna be depressed for at least five more. So take at least a few years and watch the market and learn what's going on. One thing that's really important is you are under no pressure. There's no obligation, there's no hurry. Yes, you should always start evaluating things and learning things as soon as you can. The more you know, the more power you have, but you aren't under some real, you know, we're not under the gun to go get a house before they're off the market. If anything, houses keep coming on to the market and there's more and more availability. There are very, very few houses in the country that are so unique and so rarely available that you would have to race to get one and not have any option at all. That's not really a thing. There may be just a wonderful house that you wish you could get and maybe someone will buy it. Maybe. The chances that anyone is going to buy any house that you're looking at is extremely low. It can happen, but it is extremely low. And there is very few houses that you would be looking at and be so excited about and have them be the only one that exists. There's almost certainly going to be something equal or better at a price equal or better before the time you actually need to buy a house. So that's, it's one of those things that becomes very powerful, this emotional, but this is the house I want. And that's a very bad way to feel about property in most cases. Now we start to feel that way a little bit because we've already selected the village that we want to live in. We've already invested in it heavily. We're a major part of the community. We don't want to leave the area. So when we find something that we really like, that we think we want to have as a permanent thing, we do feel a bit of pressure to have that. Because if it goes, it goes. We may never see it on the market again. And it's a very tiny community. So we risk that things will disappear, that's real. But it's also real that the average, even hotel, let alone house, houses typically turn over every few years, the hotels almost as often. It's a bit ridiculous, but I believe something like 80% of all the hospitality properties in the area that we live in have turned over in the time that we've been here. That's crazy, but it's real. Now, we've been here during a time of upheaval. We were here during COVID, so that has a big effect. There's only one major property in the entire area that I know is still held by the person that was holding it when we first arrived. I'm sorry, there are two. I know of two plus one restaurant. That is it, two hotels and a restaurant. And of the places that are still there, every single one of them 
every one of them of the hotels has had a conversation with me about the possibility of finding a buyer. Every single one of them or one of my people has had a conversation with them about finding a buyer. Most of them have no hope of finding a buyer because they want too much money or they're just not worth anything. There's no way for someone to buy it. It just, it, it would be crazy. But almost every single place that is out there is interested in getting out at least maybe not from the town but getting out from being a business investor because there's no profits to be made so even the businesses that you think are relatively stable are turning over on an unbelievable basis we've been here less than three years and we're one of the old guard already and that we are not in a position of trying to find a buyer makes us completely unique there's nobody like us that's been around and been a part of the community and been so involved and continues to want to be involved into the long-term future. It just isn't the way that things happen. So it's really important uh, that you look at things and have this realistic view of if you get into something, there's a real good chance that you're not going to want to stick with it long-term. Very few people do. And of those that do, there's so much opportunity for things turning over that you can almost be certain that what you want or something just like it will become available sometime in the reasonably near future. So if you're just a little bit patient, the ability to get really good deals on exactly the things you want, and then take whatever additional savings you've had to customize those houses, upgrade those houses, upgrade those businesses, whatever, to make them just what you want in that perfect way, there's ways to do that and win dramatically in this market. I know at the end of the day, it sounds crazy that the thing to do is be patient, get here, spend as much time as you can, go to the places where you've determined you want to live, walk around, get to know every property, and really make an informed decision in person and make contacts in person. If you really want to take it to the next level and do it the way that we did, which I think has been very successful, it requires that plus having a team of people. And this doesn't mean employees. It can mean trusted friends who live here because you only, you know, unless you're going to start a real estate company, in which case you need to hire employees, right? That, that's different. But if you are a person who's living here, chances are you're going to eventually have Nicaraguan friends who are going to be able to go out and negotiate some things for you and protect you from the gringo pricing problem. By the time you're ready to buy a house, you should have those contacts. And I know everybody's different. Everybody's situation is different. And maybe you're going to live in an enclave and that will defeat that capability. But in general, the vast majority of people, when you're looking at how do you replicate the success of the people who are you're generally seeing as successful, Right. And this is the thing I have in business a lot. People say, I want to be successful like this person. And you're like, okay, this is how they did it. And they're like, no, that's crazy. I can't do with that. And you're like, well, but that's how they were successful. You have to replicate what they did to replicate their type of success. There's other ways to be successful, but if you want to learn from them, this is how they did it, right? And this is how we did it. We took the time to know the market extensively. We took the time to become members of society, members of the community, and we have connections. We have connections at all different levels of society. So people are keeping an eye out on deals for us. People are bringing us deals. People are willing to go out and negotiate deals on our behalf. We have a fantastic lawyer. We have a fantastic accountant. We've had those things. We've had time to establish those relationships. We've also had mediocre lawyers. We've also had bad lawyers. We've also had bad accountants. We've had bad bookkeepers. We've eliminated the bad. We have the good. And now we have a, this wonderful community of people who are uh, part of our team, part of our social circles, and that has given us a lot of power to be able to find really good deals, to be able to negotiate really good deals, to be really confident that we're co protected legally, that we're, we're really getting the right deed and we really have a lawyer looking out for us and all those pieces. That's all come through patience and putting in time, living here and being a part of the community. And of course, learning Spanish has helped, but that was not required. Right. Very few, absolutely nothing that we've done has happened because we have some mastery of Spanish. That's absolutely not the case. Um, we, we have very little mastery of Spanish, first of all, but we did not use what Spanish we had in any situation that has worked out for us. We've always had a translator. We've always had someone handling it for us to make that happen. So that's, that's not a factor, but people will imagine that it is. At the end of the day, it's all about patience and putting in the time. Um, and we're going to talk about, because some people had some, some questions about making the transitions and some of the things I said sound really scary. We're going to talk about some of that, why some people really feel they need to be in an enclave, why some people are really afraid of the gringo price and all those things. We're going to go into that, not in today's episode. I really wanted to cover this what to do thing. And I think it's important that when people, when you're looking at the people who are being successful here, almost always, it's some process like this where they didn't jump the gun, 
or their successes came after they jumped the gun. Maybe they jumped the gun, got burned, decided to, to ride it out, have then been here, had the contacts, and their future endeavors have been good because they have learned the culture, become a part of it, been patient, waited for good deals, and were able to identify what was a good price, to identify what was a good contract, to identify what was a good relationship, and to know which of those places was going to be the thing that worked out well for them, right? You may come and say, oh, I wanna live on the beach, and then learn, ooh, I don't like the beach at night. It's too quiet. I want to be in the city where there's bars at night because I just didn't realize that that's how I was going to live my life here. And some of those things, you need time as well. So that's an additional piece. You're not just learning about Nicaragua through having patience and putting in the time here. You're also learning about yourself and how you are in Nicaragua and in the specific place that you want to be in. My lifestyle in Leon and my lifestyle in the beach and my lifestyle in Madagalpa and my lifestyle in Managua are related but different. I do different things in each of those places. I walk different amounts. I walk different types of places. I go out to different types of restaurants and bars. I do different activities in each one, mostly because they offer different things and different climates and different uh, terrains. But learning how those things interact for you will be a major factor in learning what places will make sense for you. For example, if I live in Matagalpa, a really important, important part of the lifestyle for me is being able to go to all the cafes. And that means I would want to live within walking distance of a majority of the cafes or the cafes that I like. But here in Leon, that's not a big thing. And the cafe that I like is actually in the outskirts of the city going towards the beach. So the places that I go are very different than I would do in Matagalpa, where I would be downtown, almost certainly. Here, I find down, downtown to not be very beneficial for me. But when I go out on a Friday night, I do want to be downtown, but I've figured out transportation that makes that make sense. Little things like that can be really big factors. So I hope this was useful and answered the what to do. I know it isn't the answer you're looking for. I can't give you the answer you're looking for. There isn't any magic button of give me a good price, let me find it online, do it like we do in, in North America, do it like we do in Europe. I wish that we could, and that is something that Nicaragua needs for its future to really help it catapult forward, but it would also drive a huge influx of expats that could be a bit much for the country. It needs to be handled carefully if that's something that is ever going to happen. But that is a long way off, and require a lot of technology, a lot of boots on the ground, a lot of education, a lot of time. It's not going to happen anytime soon. There's nothing like it in the works. Nobody, the only people who've talked about that completely lacked in the technology and the know-how and the business acumen to even make it work, let alone make it successful. And so that it's, it's not something that's coming. So because it's not coming, because it does not exist, you can't just wish it into existence, which is kind of where everyone is. They're so all of us are so much like this is, I'm not okay with how it is. There's other places do it other ways. I am certain if I want it enough that I can treat Nicaragua the way that I would treat some other place that does have central listing services, that does have comps, that does have the ability to research online and that it will, it will work out. Maybe it's not the absolute best deal, but it'll work out. And the reality is, is it almost never does. You really are putting yourself in an extreme level of danger and often for something that, if you really stop and think about it, probably, not always, but probably isn't much of a benefit. Why do you feel you need to own a house? Why do you feel the need to buy a house before you do those things to make it really valuable? What aspect of owning a house is, is emotionally driving so much importance? Um, and maybe there is some things, but I would recommend that you sit down and really are, try to articulate in writing to yourself, to your spouse, to whoever, these are the reasons that I feel I must buy a house. And if you have questions about that, here's my list. Why, why shouldn't I buy a house? Put them in the comments. Let's talk about them and let's dig into that. Maybe they do make sense. Maybe they don't. And there's things you haven't thought about. It is very common for people to say, well, I need to buy a house for residency. Well, buying a house may actually work against your residency. So one of the reasons that people say all the time that they want it actually is a reason not to do it, or at least to be patient and do it well. Um, there's a lot of those kinds of factors where people misinterpret what residency means, what um, buying a house actually gives them, all those kinds of things. So it's important to make sure you have solid reasons for your decision making and understand what your goals are rather than getting focused on some in-between things, right? Oh, I want to be able to go to Nicaragua anytime I want. Okay, owning a house probably makes that harder. Oh, uh, but I really want residency. Okay, but owning a house probably makes that harder. And why do you want residency? There's probably not a good reason for that either. Stop and think about that part too. What's your end goal? Well, I just want to be able to go to Nicaragua anytime I want. Done. You all have that magic right now. Just come on down. You get 180 days. You don't need to own a house. You don't have to have residency. 
Spend that time, get to know people, build your reputation, build the, the social structures that you need, get to know the market, and then make those great decisions. But a lot of the things that people think they want, they already have, and they're not leveraging them today, often because they're letting the desire for residency or the desire to own a house actually hinder them from just coming down and enjoying being in paradise. So consider, just come down, spend some time, get to know the market, start building that reputation, start building those things, and then make good decisions once you've been patient. Like and subscribe if you'd like to support the channel. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller and help make this show possible. It means a lot to me, everyone who does that. Thank you so much to all the little people who live in my GoPro box. And if you have a moment, Tell your friends or family about the show. Let someone know. Go on Reddit and Facebook, whatever, LinkedIn, and uh, post a link to this episode or others. And, of course, take a moment. Watch another episode. It makes a big difference. And I will see all of you tomorrow.